trust I'm holding on It's a love, it's a Your hope and love It's a love, it's a Your hope and love In your hand I'll face the stars In your will I'm pressing on Twenty-eight, the uh, the empty tomb. Let's have a, a word of prayer. Father, we come to this in a sense, uh, such a holy passage of scripture describing the empty tomb and the message from the angel to those that were there that uh, that you are not there. You've risen from from the dead. It means everything to us, Lord. And uh, we just pray that uh, though 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 we know this, we know that. Know it intellectually, Lord. We just pray that uh, by your Spirit, the, the message that here would have a, a newness of life to, to our own hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, a- amen. Oh, time out. I'm going to move this just a little. I felt it right at the back of my heel, and I could just tell that it wouldn't take much to. That'd be a little distraction for I kicked that over in the middle of the service. I got a feeling it would. There was a, uh, a bank in um, uh, Binghamton, New York, that, uh, that had a competitor that moved into actually a nicer, a nicer facility. And they, they thought that they would be uh, in a bigger facility, a, a competitor again, but they thought they'd be gracious and send them some flowers, kind of congratulate them and so forth. But the flower shop made a, a little, a little mix-up, and there was also a funeral that day. Uh, and so... The, the flowers arrived to the bank from the competition that said, with our deepest sympathy. <laughs> I don't know what they thought of that. But the other card was more interesting, the one that was supposed to go to the bank that actually went to the funeral uh, to the person there that had just passed away. And that card read, congratulations on your new location. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be a, very appropriate if that was a, a, a believer uh, and has everything to do with our, our message this morning. We... Um, we sometimes, again, talk about uh, the idea of, of death and resurrection and being with the Lord forever, and yet uh, oftentimes we're not really sure what our position is on that. I, I like this one quote from a Decision Magazine of a, a number of years ago. The author says, uh, we hate and fear death and do anything to postpone it even for a little while. But if we are unable to die, it would be worse. The blind would remain blind. The retarded child would never have a normal mind. The injustices of this world would continue to prevail. Those terminally ill would remain ill but never terminate. And aching hearts would continue to ache and never be healed. The promise of God is that we die yet are not dead. If Jesus lives in us, we will have changed lives and live eternally. So we, we often say we're living for uh, for all eternity as, as believers, and this message is, is, the, is the foundation for that. Uh, what we're going to do is look at the first eight verses uh, next week. We'll deal with the appearances of Jesus. The following week, we'll then deal with what we refer to as the Great Commission. The next week, will we'll take us to uh, Easter or sunrise service, and then we'll look what Paul has to say from 1 Corinthians 15 on, on the, uh, the bodily of resurrection, where he gives several illustrations they might really understand uh, what resurrection is all about. Verse 1, Matthew 28. After the Shabbat or Sabbath at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. So we notice first that it's the women who return uh, and they're identified as, as eyewitnesses. And uh, Luke does that for us in, in his gospel. And we've been kind of making reference to the fact that these women are very important eyewitnesses because they are there when Jesus is on his way to the cross. And he has this conversation, predicts judgment upon uh, Jerusalem. Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. It's these same women that now watch him crucified and die on the cross. It's the same women that are now at the tomb as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus Put Jesus in the tomb, prepare him, the stone is rolled, they witness the whole thing, they know exactly where it is, where the location, and so forth. And now it's these same women that come back to an empty tomb. So these, 
These gals are very important in terms of, of the, the eyewitness to the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And again, it's Mary Magdalene, it's Mary the mother of James, it's Joanna, and there's, there's others that are with them. As I said, Luke identifies quite a few of them for us. We notice that they return after the Sabbaths, and, and I put it plural because that's what it is in a, in a Greek text. I'm not sure why they, they choose to make it singular in, in English, but uh, again, uh, it's at the first day of the week. We've talked about it before, but just because there are sometimes, um, quote, apparent contradiction or people get wrong ideas about Jesus being uh, in the grave, literally three 24-hour periods, and then, and then there's all this debate on when he died and so that we get him rising again from the dead on, on Sunday morning and so forth. But just, again, keep in mind that that three days and three nights is just a Jewish idiom. We see it used in the book of Esther, other places. It just means a portion of those three days and three nights. Jesus eats the Passover lamb on Thursday night with his disciples. Uh, and then uh, Friday, on the first day of unleavened bread, he's, he is arrested, he is crucified, he is in the grave, then that portion of Friday, they have to hurry. We looked at that last week to get him in before the next day began, which is at sundown uh, on, a, on a Jewish calendar. He's there all day Saturday, and then he rises again on the first day of first fruits in fulfillment of that, which is why we worship on, uh, on Sunday. Notice they say again explicitly on the first day of the week, because we say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday all based on pagan events and a pagan calendar. <laughs> I don't know if you know that's where that came from. But in their minds, everything was from the Sabbath. This is the day we worship the Lord. What's the next day? The first day after that, the first day, <laughs> you know, so forth. Everything uh, centered around uh, the worship of God. So there's two Sabbaths in a, in a row there. Uh, the second thing also, the women, again, they're the first to return and they are critical in terms of eyewitness testimony uh, of the resurrection. Secondly, it's an angel who reveals the empty tomb. We see that in verses 2 to 4. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So again, it's the angel who reveals the empty tomb, and he's come down from from heaven. And we'll talk about this earthquake more in a moment, but just note that in a, in a Greek text, it doesn't tie the, the angel coming down to the earthquake. There was a violent earthquake or a great earthquake, and also an angel came down from heaven. And the purpose of the angel coming down is to roll the stone away, not to let Jesus out, but to, so they can he can let these eyewitnesses in so they can see that the tomb uh, is... Uh, is empty. And most commentaries believe uh, that that great earthquake, that violent earthquake, is when Jesus rose again from the dead. Again, not when the angel came down. Now, he rolls the stone away, and he sits on it. And keep in mind, we've talked about the fact that a, a, a stone about three feet high would take 10 guys and the right kind of leverage to, <clears throat> to roll it up the incline. This is a larger, a larger stone. And so, again, just the, the power of the angel to do that, and he does it so that uh, these women, and we'll see Peter and John in a moment, can get into the tomb. But we notice that this angel has a startling appearance. His uh, appearance was like lightning, and that means his face. <laughs> and when it says, I mean, if you, if you go to some uh, uh, other translations, it'll say his face is like, like lightning. That doesn't mean a whole lot to us here in Hawaii because we, we don't see a lot of lightning. And when we do, it's, wow, it's way down there, you know. But um, going up to visit Josh in uh, Colorado Springs, there, uh, you know, you're on the edge of the Rockies and th they have some big time lightning there. <laughs> I mean, they have lightning that hits the ground not, not far from you. I mean, and uh, I can remember on one, one occasion uh, coming out of a theater and it's raining a little bit. We're with Josh and one of his other buddies who have now lived there for a few years, there's some lightning going on, and, hey, wow, that's pretty exciting. You know, it's like, <laughs> dumb tourist. You know, and they're like, we should get in the car now. <laughs> they're like, no, no, we should get in the car now. You know, we're, uh, is that getting closer? <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, we, they're like, you know, they're not 
raising their voices, but there's this urge, we should really get in the car right now. And we, we get in the car and, and the lightning hit the ground. I mean, it was, it was radical. <laughs> it was like, okay, that was scary. <laughs> So, I mean, so, you know, if you, if you have that image and it says his face is like lightning, uh, there, there's a reason that the, the Roman guards fell down and, and, and thought they were dead men. There's a, uh, a passage of an, another heavenly being in Daniel chapter 10 uh, that says, uh, uh, Daniel speaking there or writing, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of finest gold around his waist. His body was like crystallite. His face was like lightning again. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Uh, there's a reason why every time an angel shows up in the Bible, they say, don't be afraid. And it's because people are terrified at their, at their appearance. His face is like lightning. His clothes were as, as white as snow. And again, Matthew, the, the author here, is just trying to, the best he can in just a few words try to give us a sense of what this heavenly being w- was all about. But it's this angel that reveals the empty tomb. Third, it's the Roman guards who are terrified. Uh, again, the text says they shook and became like dead men. And uh, we talked last week in the burial of Jesus uh, the week before about his crucifixion, the idea that this Roman guard that went with him, and we pointed out the fact that, uh, that these are the Roman guards that were there with Pontius Pilate. This is, in a sense, like his special forces. They're just not your, your average, average guys. These are veteran combat troops. Uh, and when they go out with Jesus, they're callous. They're, they're mocking uh, his crucifixion. These are the ones that, uh, that beat him and then stood before him and, oh, hail, you know, king of the Jews, placed the crown of thorns on his head. And so they're pretty callous guys. Uh, but remember, it by the time Jesus dies on the cross, they've witnessed an earthquake. We're going to talk about a great earthquake, but they, they witnessed an earthquake. They witnessed the sun becoming uh, dark for three hours in the middle of the day from noon till three in the afternoon. They've listened to Jesus continually say from the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Uh, they've heard him say at the end, after this is all done, and he's not even recognizable as being a human being because his face is beat to such a, a pulp, but yet he's expressing forgiveness to those that are doing this to him. And at the end, in a loud cry, he says, to tell us die, it's finished. And then he commends his spirit and he dies. He commends his own spirit to leave and he dies. And by the time it's all over, these guys are up and the centurion, basically the officer that uh, uh, is over them, is saying that he was the son of God. He was a righteous man. It says they were glorifying and praising God. And, uh, and what I want to suggest is that by the time these guys get back to the barracks that night and somebody says, what was your day like? They said, oh, just same old, same old. I don't think that's what they said. I think pretty much everybody there knew at least some of the events that, that happened. Everybody knew about the earthquake. Everybody knew about the darkness. And everybody probably heard a little bit of the story of Jesus dying on the cross. It's, not, it's probably not the same guys that go out the next day to guard the tomb. But I want to suggest they'd heard a little bit of what was going on and what had transpired in the last 24 hours in, uh, in Jerusalem. And now this, this earthquake comes. Now, I mentioned the fact that it was, it's called in English great or a violent earthquake. It's only used a few times in, in the New Testament. Uh, there's a, a parallel of, of that same word in, in Hebrew and Ezekiel. I want to read to you there because it has to do with the, the Magog invasion. And my point is, every time you see this word, something really dramatic is, is going on. Uh, and in Ezekiel 38, he's writing about a future time, which is just days ahead of us, it seems like, when there would be uh, an invasion of Israel with, uh, uh, with Russia, with Iran, and a few other Arab or Muslim nations, excuse me, uh, Muslim nations, and they will make a move against against Israel. Uh, God will intervene and destroy two-thirds of, of their army. Russia will be a, won't be a player any, any longer in the events of uh, the history of the world. But in the midst of those events, which are dramatic, Ezekiel writes, in my zeal and fiery wrath, 
I declare at that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So again, there'll be something very dramatic that happens. There'll be other events as well. The same word is used in the great tribulation, uh, Revelation 6, 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. So uh, again, we're, there was an earthquake when Jesus, again, dies on the cross, but this is of a, this is of a different magnitude altogether. It's, it's very dramatic what, what happens here. And again, most commentators tie that Nothing to do with the angel coming down. Everything to do when Jesus rises again, again from the dead. Uh, the same word is used in Acts 16. Uh, not to belabor this, but I just uh, find it interesting. That there it says Paul and Silas are in the, uh, the prison there in, in uh, Philippi. And it says suddenly there was a violent, same word, violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And, and you know the rest of the story. The, <coughs> the bars break open. The uh, Philippian jailer, you know, he assumes everybody has escaped and that will mean his death. And so he says, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul and Silas are there where they've been praising the Lord. And that's what causes the uh, earthquake. And they lead him and his family to the Lord. If you go to that prison today, you, you can go in and the stocks where Paul and Silas were are still there. Uh, and there is a huge crack through the foundation of that prison cell and through that prison tied directly to this event. I only mentioned that to say, again, these are historical events that took place. And every time we put a shovel in the ground in the Middle East, there is evidence for exactly what the Bible says. You got time for a little story? I wasn't going to tell this, but I just, I was telling Kathy, I was listening to David Hawking, as I do every week. And he was talking about taking this uh, 86-year-old lady on a tour, and they were going to go to the Philippian jail. She'd been to the Middle East many times with him, but wanted to go on that tour because she always wanted to go in that, that prison. And the reason she wanted to go in that prison is, is that if you, there's a sign above, above there where Paul was in prison that says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And she explained to him, I just want to see it uh, for myself. Uh, I've, uh, we didn't have any children. I'm a widow. My husband's with the Lord. And that's my life. That's, that's what I've got. For me to live is Christ. Hey, to be with the Lord, to die would be gain. I'm, <laughs> I'm ready. But I want to see the place, you know, where Paul was in prison. I want to get my picture taken next to that plaque. So she goes on the whole thing. They go on the tour. David does the teaching. And um, I got a feeling David Hawking was a little bit bigger than the Apostle Paul, but he, you know, he's the guy that volunteers to get down into the stocks and does the whole thing and teaches. She gets her picture taken. She's going out of the steps of the prison, falls and hits her head and dies. She goes to be with the Lord right then. Does the funeral on the, on the boat <laughs> as, as they're there. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, but lived out what she really believed. I mean, to, uh, to just see it, you know, one time, uh, the place where Paul was, where there was a, a great earthquake, where something dramatic took place, uh, something that took place when Jesus rose again from the dead. I had to tell you, this is a little story. It has nothing to do with my message. I just couldn't resist. But the, uh, <laughs> don't get me started. I got a lot. <laughs> I got, I got, I got. Maybe I'll tell another one at the end. The, uh, but again, it's the women who are first to return to the tomb. So these women become critical to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ because they are the eyewitnesses, unlike the guys that bailed, they are the eyewitness to all of the events that go through. Marching to the cross, watching the cross, seeing him buried, coming back the next day, and they are the first ones, and they become the deliverers, in a sense, uh, of, of the message that he's risen from from the dead. The Roman guards are, are terrified. And then fourthly, uh, it's an angel who announces that Jesus has risen, and that's in verses 5 to 7. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him now I have told you. First, we note that the angel encouraged the women to, to not be afraid. And certainly that had everything to do with the circumstances, the empty tomb, Jesus not being there, his appearance, and, and so forth. 
Uh, but again, how does he encourage them not to be afraid? Don't be afraid. Come and see Jesus has risen from the dead. And what I want to suggest is that that is the key for us to not be afraid as well, to realize that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. A lot of the stuff that we fear in this life has, is pale when we think about the fact that it doesn't really matter. Jesus Christ is has risen from the dead. I don't know if any of you were shaken in your boots when the U.S. dollar was devalued to almost nothing this week. Or did you even know? Oh, that's right. Those guys got those bonuses. I'm so upset about that. And while we're all upset about that, <laughs> our good friend Bernicke uh, takes money and puts it in his pocket and then takes it out several trains of dollars and then throws it back into the, uh, into the, uh, the marketplace again. Uh, and we printed a bunch of money to be able to do that because we didn't really have that money because we were so far in debt. Hey, that's okay anyway. But what it did is it, it devalued the U.S. dollar. Now, I don't know what makes that interesting as well. That could make things kind of scary. Uh, the price of gold sure shot up that day. Uh, I'm, I'm not giving investment recommendations here. I'm just, it's just interesting what's going on. People are fearful about these things. There was more than one suggestion coming out of the European Union, and even Putin even said it himself, Prime Minister of uh, uh, Russia, soon to be czar, uh, that what he had to say was that the suggestion was if we had a world currency, which is what we need now, we wouldn't have issues like this going on in the financial markets jumping up and down. Uh, that's not like wild speculation. This is a lot of people are talking about this right now. That what we need is a one world currency. Does that like like ring a bell with anybody? You know, they're not saying cashless yet, but that would help, wouldn't it, with the identity theft and everything that's going uh, going on. <laughs> There's reason for people to be very concerned in our world, and even sometimes for us. But what I want to say is that what the angel said is still true. Don't be afraid. He's not here. He's risen from the dead. And so much of our life here, it is, it's just a vapor yeah, in the end. We are going to be with the Lord. Paul says, uh, Philippians 3.21, that our politics, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, who by his power, um, who by the power that enables him to, to basically hold everything under his control in this universe will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Uh, for us, could we be fearful? Could we be afraid? I think we have, can be, but I think a great application is the heeds the wor heed the words of Jesus. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Also, Mary's response is... Uh, is interesting, and I've got to go to John's gospel for that, John 20, 13. Uh, they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Now, she could have said at that point, I've seen the angel at the tomb. That's a good title of a book. I could sell a lot of copies here. Angel at the tomb, and right, angels are very popular. They're probably popular in those days. Mary could have been thinking, I could make a lot of money here. I, you know, which people have a tendency to do when they have these, quote, supernatural experiences. But the angel is before her. His, uh, his clothes are like white as snow. His face is like lightning that's flashing. But her biggest concern, naturally being fearful, but her biggest concern is, where's the body of Jesus Christ? She was more interested in finding the dead corpse of Jesus than she was talking to an angel. I just find that interesting. Um, now, she doesn't really know that he's risen from the dead yet. She hasn't really got that. She hasn't really figured out. But besides all of that, her love for the Lord was greater than some conversation she could have with a heavenly being. And I want to say there's a lot of people in the world that would, re would switch that. You know, they, they, they'll take the supernatural uh, any time. But she was very interest, more interested in where Jesus was. But it's the angel that informs them then that, uh, that he is not in the tomb uh, he is risen. And what the uh, angel does at this point, I think, is very significant as well. He doesn't say, he is risen, take my word for that. No, he's rolled the stone away. And he says, come and see. Here's the evidence. Here's what you need to see. I need you to be eyewitnesses to the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because you're the ones that have seen the whole course of events. And I need you to know so you can tell others what you saw with, with, your, with your own eyes. I just appreciate the, uh, the mounting evidence for the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the angel promises that they'll see Jesus again. He's not here. You will see him. Verse 7, 
He's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him. So again, it's an angel that actually announces that Jesus has risen. But notice, lastly, it's the disciples who are still waiting to receive the news. Verse 8, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. And uh, we want to talk about Peter and John, because John's gospel tells us that it's these two guys that get the news, and then they, they run. Basically, they have a foot race to get to the, uh, to the tomb. But I, I've got to, just because we've had a lot of fun with Peter in this study, I've got to read you Mark's, Mark's account of the same thing, because there's a, there's a great line here. Uh, Mark 16, 2, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, these are the gals, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You were looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him. We're good so far, parallel account, <laughs> but notice the go and tell. But go tell his disciples and Peter. <laughs> He's going ahead of you into Galilee. Uh, then uh, you will see him just as he told you. I just get a kick out of that Peter is mentioned specifically. And Peter basically, Mark's gospel is Peter telling Mark his, his eyewitness account. But uh, uh, Peter singled out the guy that denied him, the guy with foot and mouth disease, the guy that arguing over who's the greatest, all these things that are going down. And I just think as Peter and John you know, are there, and as far as they know, Jesus is dead. He's died on the cross. Uh, they may not even be aware of the fact of uh, what Joseph of Arimathea has done and, uh, and Nicodemus. They're just basically hiding out, hoping we're not crucified today ourselves, since we're part of the conspiracy against Rome that Jesus has been found guilty of. And they're shaking in their, shaking in their boots. Uh, and um, so as the gals come running up, he's, he's alive, his, his tomb, you know, is empty, and we saw the angel, and he told us, and, and Peter, he mentioned you by name. <laughs> I, just, I just think that cracks me up. But uh, after receiving the news, then they take off, off running. That's in John 23. So uh, Peter uh, and the other disciple, that's John, he's the author, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. John has to throw that in. By the way, did I mention that I, I outran Peter and reached the tomb first? I just appreciate as the Holy Spirit is right, inspiring these guys to write, the personality is, is still there. Uh, I want to also mention they ran in unbelief. Luke 24, 11 says, but they did not believe the women because their words seem like nonsense. They're not like, oh, hallelujah, he's raised from the dead, praise the Lord, you know, and that's not what they're doing. I mean, they're running to see what happened because something has happened. There's been a great earthquake. The stone has rolled away. The women are saying these things. Mention my name, actually, Peter's thinking. And, and so they're running there and, uh, to get there, but it's in unbelief. But uh, after they... Uh, see the tomb, Peter and John have different reactions. I want to spend uh, a little bit of time on this. If you're a Bible underliner, you might want to turn to John 20, uh, verse 5. Otherwise, I'll, I've got it for you on the, on the screen. There's a couple of very important Greek words that uh, will help us understand what transpires once they, they get there. But again, remember, uh, John is about 17 when Jesus calls him as a disciple. He's a pretty young guy. He's three years. He's about 20. And and, uh, and that, that's the reason he, he outran uh, Peter getting there. I can testify to the fact that uh, you run faster when you're younger. But uh, they both get there, but they have both very different uh, reactions. And, and again, we'll, we'll notice that, that John does get there first, and he kind of waits at the edge of the tomb uh, and kind of is trying to, uh, like, what's going on here? And then Peter, in classic form, gets to him and barges right by him and just goes, goes right on in. He sees something as well. And then John comes in and joins him. But it begins in verse 5. He bent over and looked, this is John, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Uh, and uh, we've got three looks at this. The word look here is the Greek word blepo. It means a casual glance. To behold, to beware, to perceive, to regard, to see. It's just, he's, he's just looking. It's just a casual glance. Uh, and then 
Uh, it says in verse 7, Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went in the tomb. He saw, different word. He looked, he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. Uh, the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from, from the linen. Uh, here, as it says, Peter saw is the uh, Greek word theero, <laughs> theoreo. <laughs> And uh, I don't think that's an Irish word. I think there's just an O on the end. But uh, what it means, sorry, I don't mean to throw you off at that. Peter gave careful thought to what he saw. He was observing what was going on. It's the root word for our English word to theorize. And so John gets there and he kind of stops and he's observing what's going on. He looked, Peter barges past him, goes in and he saw. But what he saw is causing him to try to theorize What's happened? This is what the, the women said. We don't believe them anyway. Uh, but there's something going on here because this is the tomb. This is the empty tomb. And there's something that I'm looking at. And I'm not coming to any conclusions. But what I'm seeing is causing me to try to theorize what could possibly have happened here. Uh, and then it goes on. Verse 8. Finally, the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside Different word for saw. He saw and believed. And that word is ido or ido. It means to form a mental perception to understand. It means bingo, the light went off. So something happened with John that did not happen with Peter. What was it that John saw? And it's very important if you haven't really understood this before. I think as a kid growing up going to Sunday school, I've seen enough flannel grass and <laughs> pictures of the empty tomb. When it talks about the linen and then the other cloth folded in line there, I somehow picture Jesus rises from the dead. He kind of folds these things up like you would your, your uh, sheet or something and lays it at the, at the end of the stone. That was very nice of him to take the time to do that. That's the way some of the pictures are. That's, that's not what's going on. We mentioned the fact that he had a, uh, and we kind of made uh, a little joke of it, but he had a, a Jewish burial, and that is significant because they would have taken strips of linen and used alloy, and we know, we know what that is, uh, and other spices, and they would have wrapped his body up. It would have been mummified. After three days, it would have dried like a hard cast. Now, if you're old enough like me, you know what a cast is. I've had a few casts, but they don't. Now it's like Velcro stuff. I mean, so, but, uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's like a shell. So what they're looking at and what they're seeing on this stone slab is the perfect form of Jesus from his feet, his ankles, his legs, his waist, his chest, his arms. It's a cast of his body. But guess what? There's nothing in it. There's nothing in it. How do you... You know, Peter's like, man, I can't really come to any conclusions uh, here. I don't want to make any hasty judgments. Peter walks in, he sees that and goes, I believe. Man, he's, he's risen from the dead. Uh, I, that's what he saw. That, that's what he saw that, that it made it all click, uh, click for him. And I think part of what had to click for him is, uh, as well is just uh, the understanding of what was going on in terms of the facts and what Jesus said in, uh, in, in the scriptures. Uh, Peter, at that point, is not willing to believe the facts. Have you ever shared with somebody the facts of the resurrection? Give them Josh McDowell's book to read. You know, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Volume 1. That's not enough. How about Volume 2? I mean, you can get all the detailed information and still they don't believe. Uh, there was an Oxford University um, professor, Richard Swineberg, a few years ago that spoke at a very high-profile gathering of philosophers at Yale University. He wanted to make a point about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he did basically uh, 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 what is referred to as Bain's theorem, which assigns values to certain facts, and then basically you crunch the numbers to come up with the probability. Uh, in an interview with Time, New, the New York Times, he said, for someone dead for 36 hours to come to life again is, according to the laws of nature, extremely improbable. But if there is a God of the traditional kind, natural laws only operate because he makes them operate. Therefore, God doesn't have to follow natural laws. So he takes... Uh, the probability that God is real, that Jesus' behavior during his lifetime, uh, eyewitness testimony, the quality of the testimonies. He does uh, all this information, presents this thing at Yale to all these philosophers, plugs in all the numbers, runs the probability formula, adds everything up, the result. 
a 97% probability that the resurrection really, really happened. And we could go on and on with, with uh, great scholar Simon Greenleaf and, uh, and others who have uh, examined the facts for the resurrection and end up becoming believers. People hear that and everybody comes a believer. No, they, they don't. <laughs> They're kind of like Peter. There's, there's tons of evidence. There's tons of facts. This is what Paul says to help us understand what's going on sometimes with our friends and family and neighbor, 2 Corinthians 4, 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we got to pray. I mean, that's something you need to pray for, that, that God would remove the blindness from people's eyes so they could see the facts and understand the truth of the resurrection. But I think for John, if any scripture came to mind, it had to be one that Jesus referred to before from Psalm 16 that talks about David uh, and the idea of resurrection. Psalm 16 verse 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave. David firmly taught, believed, preached, wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that his body would be resurrected. Nor will let your Holy One, who's the Holy One, it's the Messiah, nor will let you, your Holy One, see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. David wrote, saying about the fact that the Messiah would come one day and he would die and he would rise again. And um, it's very interesting because only very recently uh, in Israel have rabbis stopped saying that this isn't saying what it's saying. Up until very recently, they, they denied the fact that when the Messiah came, he would need to be resurrected. But, but they, they're teaching that now when confronted with Psalm 16. They no longer deny the Messiah would have to be resurrected from the dead. His body will not see, see decay. I think that already happened once. <laughs> but it's, it's just interesting how all the pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together for, uh, for so many people in, uh, in Israel. But again, at the time, Peter nor John really probably understood the, completely the, uh, the idea of the resurrection of Jesus. And, and obviously, Peter uh, does come to that conclusion. Why? <laughs> A personal appearance, <laughs> as we'll get to next week. Jesus personally comes to, G to Peter and, and ministers to him and, in a sense, restores him. Uh, and then when Peter preaches his very first sermon, what does he preach it on? Psalm 16 and the resurrection that all along the Bible said the Messiah would come, but he would have to rise again from, uh, from the dead. Uh, in terms of a, a couple of things in, in, uh, in application, that's as far as we're going to go in our text. I want to close with, a, with an illustration and, and maybe another application, but I just want to point out some things that are a little bit theological, but I think there's a practical nature to them in terms of what should the resurrection, the empty tomb, uh, mean to us. And first, it proves that Jesus is God's son. Uh, and if you're, again, trying to... Uh, if, if you need that evidence yourself, the resurrection of Jesus should, should prove that to you. If you've got friends that have concerns about it, uh, Jesus said he had the authority to lay his life down and to take it up uh, again, John 10, 17. Secondly, it verifies the truth of Scripture. Both in the Old Testament and the, and the teachings of Jesus, he clearly taught that he would come out of the tomb, that he would, uh, he would rise again. Third, it assures of us of our own future uh, resurrection. Because Jesus died, uh, we will rise again. Paul says in, uh, in First, Corinth, uh, First Thessalonians 4, 16, that uh, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds, uh, uh, with the Lord in the clouds, to, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we will rise from the dead uh, as well. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he, uh, he dies. 
It's also for, it's proof of a future judgment. Acts 17.30, Paul's up there on Mars Hill debating with the uh, philosophers of the day. And he said that in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice. He's given proof of this to all men uh, by, by raising him from the dead. Uh, Paul says in the past, what happens? Well, uh, God might have overlooked such ignorance, but now everybody everywhere must repent. And why? Because he will judge the world with justice. Why? Why is that just? Because he's given proof of this in himself by raising Jesus from the dead. Jesus being raised from the dead is proof and justification to all men that you'll either have to accept it, reject it, but you will be judged in the future. And, and certainly that's, that's part of what we see in the preaching and the teaching in the book of Acts. The fifth thing, it's the basis for Christ's heavenly priesthood. Uh, it's uh, Hebrews 7, I think it's 23, that says, uh, He is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. As our great high priest in heaven, Jesus is there. I always used to get these letters from my, uh, uh, from my grandmothers, and, uh, uh, and they would always uh, say, uh, uh, I'm praying for you, but Jesus is praying too, you know, uh, because he is. He is our great high priest. He's risen from the dead. He's praying for us. He's interceding. I don't think anybody's really praying for me. This, no. Uh, Jesus is in heaven interceding for you. Sixth, very importantly, it gives power for Christian living. We really can't live for the Lord of our own strength. Uh, it's only his resurrection power that Paul says the same power that rose Christ from the dead is the same power that now lives in you. Uh, I just want you to consider that for, for a moment. When you prayed at some point in time, to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to ask forgiveness of your sins. At that moment when you placed your faith in him and his sufficient work on the cross, something incredibly powerful happened. I don't think I really felt that. You probably didn't feel it. But, but Jesus Christ dying on the cross, what, what do you think it took to bring him back from death? I think it took a lot of power. And, and, uh, and Paul says, it's that same power, it took that same power for you to be born again. How hard was it for you to be born again? For the righteousness of Jesus Christ to be imputed to you, for all of your sins to be forgiven. Well, I just said this little prayer. No, no there's a little more going on here. I mean, if you think about what's, what's happening in terms of, of, of time and eternity, and what God has done for you. It was powerful. How powerful. The same power that rose Christ from the dead. And then gives us that power for daily living. Seven, it assures us of a future inheritance. Because we live, have a living hope. <laughs> our, our lives are different. Uh, uh, again, it's a living hope because it's growing uh, all, all the time. Uh, Jesus lives. We're going to have a, a glorious future because of it. So uh, th there's... There's just so much, really everything. That's why Paul says that uh, if Christ is not raised, our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. But then he goes on and talks about the fact that he has and, and the hope that we have in, uh, in Jesus Christ. And sometimes we, it's a simple thing, but, but uh, I wanted to kind of give you some of the facts behind it because that simple doesn't mean it isn't powerful. It's, it's everything. Uh, I wanted to uh, tell this little story here that, uh, that I read uh, a few weeks ago. I was saving it for Easter, but I'm going to tell it to you today. The, uh, and it's a, Tom shared a kid's story. Sometimes the kids can uh, uh, really uh, make some of the most profound statements to us uh, spiritually. I think you should be writing these down, Tom. This could be a book here. It's things, things my children taught me. No, but uh, there was a, this is written by a Sunday school teacher, and she has a young guy. She's got eight and nine-year-olds, and she's got about 10 of them, and one of them is named Philip, and he has Down syndrome. And she's done her best as a teacher, as a Sunday school teacher, to try to you know, get the other kids to accept him, but the kids know he's, he's different than they are, and they really weren't that accepting of him, uh, even though she'd you know, kind of uh, done her best to talk and kind of conjole the kids. 
she was talking about the fact that uh, Easter was coming up, and, uh, and so she was thinking of something she could do for her class to try to tie in her lesson with something that would be kind of fun for them to do. And this is kind of dated because it's a few years back, and I have to ex- explain this, this part of it, is that she saved those um, Easter egg-looking things that ladies' nylons used to come in called legs. And uh, if you're old enough, you know what I'm talking about. The... Uh, I was in the grocery business. I don't know about these things, but, but it, it, I think everybody did in that era. They're all you know, the commercials and everything. So save the eggs. So she saves them, uh, these little hollow plastic eggs, and she, she gives them to each, one to each child and says, now I want you to go out in the playground here, I'll give you about 15 minutes, and I want you to find something on the playground, something outside that uh, really speaks to you about this idea of Easter and what the message of, of Easter is, is all about. So kids did that, ran wild for... 15 minutes, and they come back in, and then she sits them down, and she begins to open up the eggs, and, and of course, there's a, she opens one up, and there's a flower in there, and, you know, and because all the kids, ooh, uh, you know, and the little girl, oh, that's mine, you know, uh, you know, it, it bloomed, you know, it speaks of a new life, you know, and everything, and that's spring, and that reminds me of uh, Easter, and so, okay, well, that's nice, and then she opens the, the next one, and there's a butterfly in it, you know, and it kind of flies away, and all the kids are very impressed with that, you know, oh, butterfly. Yeah, I get that, you know, and the cocoon, and then the butterfly flies away. Uh, and then she opens another one, and a rock falls out. And that, that needed a little explanation, like, uh, okay, who put the rock in? All the kids are laughing. Well, I just, I put that in there. I knew that these other kids would put flowers and butterflies and stuff. I just wanted to be different. I, I think uh, the empty tomb is different, so I put something different, rock, you know. So, okay, great, good job, Billy. So, anyway, they go through a few more. And then she opens one, and, and there's nothing in it. And she, um, oh, okay, uh, you know, who's, whose is this one? And, it, and it's Phillips. And, uh, and she, oh, honey, couldn't you find anything? Oh, no, it's, it's empty. You know, the tomb, the tomb was empty. That's, that's Easter, the empty tomb. Jesus rose. That's it. And all the kids are like, yeah, that's it. You know, and she was just saying, what a different, these kids just accepted him at that point. I mean, he came up with the best thing. You know, there was just, it was great. She said just the whole dynamic in, in the class changed uh, after that. Uh, and then about eight months later, he went to be with the Lord. And that was kind of uh, expected by his parents. And uh, they knew that he uh, would not have the same <laughs> life and longevity of, uh, of other kids uh, and then at the funeral, of course, a lot of things went on, but uh, she mentions the thing that was significant to her is that at a point in time, <clears throat> all these kids from her Sunday school class marched up the aisle to where his little casket was, and they put an empty <laughs> pantyhose container <laughs> on the casket because they understood because the tomb was empty, Philip is not there either. He's with the Lord. The kids... The kids get it. And, uh, and certainly, it's a great illustration that maybe pulls on our heartstrings a little bit. And that's not a bad thing to help us trigger the memory of, of what we should think about. By the way, that's why we gather on Sunday to celebrate that. It's the first day of the week, the day they went to the tomb. I, I want to turn a corner with the application, though, and just read you a passage of Scripture. doesn't need a lot of commentary. And, uh, and it's a familiar one in Romans 10. And 9 and 10 is one that we memorize and share with other people. But I, I want to read on a little bit. There Paul's writing says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Can someone be saved apart from believing the resurrection of Jesus Christ? No. The answer is no. That's, that's how we're saved. Uh, you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you're safe. He says, why? For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It means your sin is no more. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, and, and certainly that's that's the major application, you know, that we can be saved because Jesus rose, rose from the dead. And I think we all get that. Now, Paul then makes a series of very logical, uh, sequential statements 
that I think sometimes we overlook. He then says in verse 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? We know the truth, but how will someone else believe if they haven't heard? And how will they hear unless someone else tells them? And how are they going to be told unless they're, they're sent? Rhetorical questions for us to ponder as, as believers. Of course, this is, Jesus is about ready after his appearance to settle them down and kind of give them what we call the, uh, the Great Commission. But uh, remember, the, the message of the empty tomb from the angel is, you don't have to be afraid. Come and see. Look at the evidence. Now you're convinced? Go and tell. And sometimes we only come and see and believe. But, but the, ha- the other half of the equation is, now go, go and tell. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, simple illustrations of, uh, from Sunday school teachers that can pull on our heartstrings and, and help us remember the, the truth of the empty tomb and what it means for us. That at a point in time, unless we are raptured to be with you, we will die, but we will be with you forever because of what you've done for us on the cross. Are we sure of that? We are sure of that because of the empty tomb. We are sure of that because of the the burial in the Roman guard, in the Roman seal. We are sure of that because when Jesus died on the cross, blood and water poured out the evidence of his ruptured heart and his death. Lord, and yet, uh, and yet he lives. As the writer of Hebrews says, the captain of our faith who's gone before us. Lord, I pray that uh, you would maybe impart to us a, a, a greater sense of, of our future with you, maybe a longing to, to be with you at, uh, at times, desire to gather and worship you, realizing that, that what it took to purchase our salvation. And Lord, I pray that you might give us a, a renewed sense of, of calling, a, a boldness, an anointing of your spirit to, uh, to be able to tell people uh, the truth. How will they know unless we tell them? And uh, that we might have a renewed sense of uh, the great commission you've, you've given us here and uh, in the islands and, and uh, really around the world through those that we've sent, that we might support and pray and be concerned and see how that you would uh, use their lives as they've gone out from us. Lord, so, so much for us to, to be thankful for, so much to ponder, Lord. But I pray that we would not be like Peter and spend the afternoon theorizing, but we'd just be like John. We'd just see and believe and, and then just trust you with faith and, and have you lead and guide and, and use our lives for all eternity's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.
Help it. 